Hello, everybody, and welcome to AstroSpeak. Today is June 23rd, 2022. My name is Anthony Pico, and AstroSpeak, this is a chat show formatted for featuring astrologers, arguing, cooperating, agreeing, disagreeing, inspiring each other, and sharing their knowledge. Uh, me and my co-host, Michaela Villers-Kendall, uh, are both uh, asking questions, and we uh, Please, though, remember, uh, we're looking for feedback and opinions, but we're asking you to keep it as short and as pithy and as to the point and succinct as possible, because uh, as we all know, we astrologers love to talk. And so we want to keep it as confined as possible. Um, you know, we wish to have a lively and active show. Don't threaten each other if you can. And uh, all of these questions are pretty much involve things that all of us have experienced. So uh, just as a reference, I'm an astrologer from New York. Michaela is in London, France. England, England. Uh, okay. I'm from London, but I'm in France. Okay. Very. Okay. And we have with us right now, Robin and Lynn and Amanda and Daniel. Welcome aboard. And Nora. Hey. Um, Thank you. How are you? And uh, all of us are, oh, and of course, Sue is helping run the entire meeting. All of us are professional astrologers, if you're listening. And uh, shall we just start with a question? Are we ready to start rolling? Okay. Um, Here's a simple one. Uh, maybe it isn't. How do you feel about astrological certification programs and certificates? I'm not specifically asking about a particular one, but the concept of certification. Do you think it benefits us? You feel like I can't, I can't be bothered. I'm, I'm, I don't need to prove myself. Just general thoughts on that. So I know an astrologer yeah. feels, you know, I don't need any help. I, I know what I'm doing, but I personally think it helps us as a group. Michaela? Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, I went to the Faculty of Astrological Studies in London back in 1990 and um, did the certification program. And I, yeah, I think it's a really good grounding, particularly with something like astrology that wasn't taken, that I felt back then wasn't taken very seriously. So you need that gravitas, you know, and to feel like you're legit as well. So, um, yeah, I think, but it, obviously there are a lot of bogus programs around so you yeah. have to you know pick yeah I'm, I'm very wary of anybody that has a, a website just because it's so easy to yeah. fake it but anybody else any thoughts about certification programs whether you enjoy them don't like them think they're bs or what i can jump in for just a second sure uh, I totally agree that certification can be great in terms of giving people grounding. And for those of us who like really structured learning, it's really helpful because it can be hard to know where to start. But I also think it's incredible to see how much free, like really high quality free information is available, like Stormy Grace's YouTube Academy or Astrology University offering courses that you can kind of buy and watch at your own pace and so I don't tend to be rigid in my beliefs about astrological certification but it's a great thing to have access to mm -hmm. I feel um, okay. yeah I agree with that Amanda mm -hmm. I yeah, was what... just going to add to it the Pluto in the final degrees of Capricorn and how it feels like uh, there's a I'm witnessing a lot of paradigms of new ways of business and, and people just kind of starting things without hierarchy, but it being a really interesting slash frustrating place. Like, oh, just come to this creative, co-creative group and, and do what you love, but there's no leader and people are confused by that. I think it's kind of similar to um, if you're starting out as an astrologer, you kind of want somebody who's a mentor saying, hey, you're good at this. I think you're doing a great job. If you do X, Y, Z, you'll probably be successful. Like maybe at some point we will evolve out of needing somebody to tell us that we're good and deserve to do something. But mm -hmm. as a collective, it does kind of seem like it, it's beneficial just to at least have that mentorship and, and the community. Yeah. Well, we do have Pluto slipping into Aquarius, so that's going to change uh, yeah. change that Capricorn structure yeah. and uh, make it open up a bit more. But uh, the only thing that drives me nuts are people that I'll see sometimes um, clearly don't have enough of a grasp of astrology and offering advice on Facebook and whatnot. And I, and I try to step in and I try not to be nasty about it. <laughs> But uh, you want to scream at somebody. It's like, you don't know what the, you're doing. Stop it. You're ruining everything. But um, so certification helps in that sense. It's, uh, if nothing else, it means that there's another group of people that we all agree on something. So there's a mass consensus. It's not like I'm just some lunatic wandering the streets preaching something. And that's what I like about consensus, that there's a group consensus to a degree with a certification program. 
it's, um, it's not a, it's not actually licensure license sir i can't say that word licensure you know it would be yeah. licensed um it, it, it i i think that you know if we are an industry we're you know a fledgling industry that's not quite reached that that level of of uh you know, uh, certification yet, but I, th I think it's good. I think I, I think it's important that we all pay attention to the learning process. Um, and, but learning, you know, we all have different cognitive uh, natures, and so we all learn differently. So it's it's. I think it's hard to you know package this all in the same way and say, well, you know, this this is how you should learn. For, the, the other issue is there's so many different schools of astrology, huh. uh, you know. Um, though I, it, it, I, 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 you know, I, I support all of the learning techniques, but I have to admit that for, you know, for basically 50 years, I've been a self-study. Um, and, and my classroom really has been, uh, you know, with my clients, I've learned more, you know, in, in a single session than in, in reading four or five books. So, um, but, but yes, I think it's important that there, that there is a structure, that there is a pathway uh, for people, if they want to follow it, and you know that there's there's you know material that's you know readily available for them at an affordable price to learn, absolutely. Okay, if we want, we can move on unless somebody has anything else to say. I have one um, thing to add, and that's sure. that er everybody learns differently, and so uh, you know that's one thing to be said about you know maybe not having to to follow a, a certain structure and, mm -hmm. you know, and a certain path to, to, to get licensed. Like Daniel said, he, he you know, he, it's been a lot of self-study, same here, a lot of self-study, but I've also done, you know, some certification, you know, but, you know, I feel like everybody learns differently. Everybody um, should have the opportunity to do that as well. Yeah. I, I had a student who, uh, I was trying to teach him the way I normally teach. And uh, he kind of taught me instead because he just wanted me to read charts in front of him. So I would pull out my files and just read another chart. And, and within about six months, he, he absorbed it all, uh, which, you know, is certainly not, I mean, I'm a Capricorn, I'm a weird Capricorn, but I'm still very structure oriented. And I was actually impressed because um, ultimately it's results-based and he picked it up but it was just literally reading charts and he just listened to me and absorbed it all. So yeah, everybody's got their own style. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. So we're going to get a little heavy for our next question. Okay. Um, there's a lot going on in the world around us right now, uh, you know, between well, all the things that are happening. I mean, I'm not going to even detail them. So people are beginning to think these times are apocalyptic. I have friends of mine who, this is actually one of Michaela's questions. I should have let you take it over. I'm sorry. Good, good. No, no, you I'm, go ahead. I'm, uh, I'm being very white male here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think that's great. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I have friends that are like giving up. Oh, America's destroyed, whatever. The economy's going crazy, gasoline, et cetera, war in Ukraine. People are thinking these times are apocalyptic and they're wanting astrologers maybe to take on you know, what this means, how do I live in that? I'm not a mundane astrologer. Does anybody have any look at what's going on right now and what you might tell people to help them through the next few years? Uh, I'm pretty positive about the future and maybe I'm a Pollyanna, but um, when I have had a lot of people talk to me about this and, um, you know, I try to explain to them that we're in a transitional period and if you look at what's happening, there's always some kind of turmoil before we move into a new paradigm of how we live. And I explain to them, uh, you know, uh, and I do use astrological terms with it and talk about, you know, what is happening with Pluto and how we're transforming and we're growing and we have to get rid of what doesn't work and, and to be able to bring into what does work and to move into the future. So I talk to them about this and tell them to look for what is positive because the negative is eventually going to fall away. But what we're seeing on the other side is where we're really going. And that's very positive. And then I give them examples of what is positive that, you know, we, we focus so much on the negative. We don't see what's going on on the positive side. And it's always there. 
uh, there's there's a balance always going on. It's just we don't always pay attention to the balance. And uh, a lot of times when I've explained it, you know, in those terms and, and obviously much more detail, uh, they seem to get a calmness about them like, oh, OK, so everything's working the way it's supposed to. Yeah, everything is working the way it's supposed to. It may not be fun for you, but it is this way and we're we're moving in the right direction. And and that is really how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm inclined to agree. I, I try to explain about the Aquarian age and mm -hmm. I'm saying some people don't want to go into the Aquarian age. Mm -hmm. Some of us do. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's going to be a little crazy, I think, for a while because there's a lot of uh, kickback, people not wanting to go forward. Yeah. But uh just tell them to try to stay out of the way of moving objects and move forward and concentrate <laughs> on what they need to do. I'm actually very hopeful too. I've try not to be Pollyanna, but I do think we're entering an age and the individual becomes more important as we leave, you know, uh, you know, the age of Pisces behind, you know, we back when we had medieval ages, people didn't even sign their paintings because they were just in this religious fervor. And now we're getting to a point where I think the individual in service to society is really what's kind of going to be coming, you know, and we hear now about teenagers inventing robots that go to the, that go across the ocean and collect plastic. And these people are mm -hmm. working from an isolated point of view, not always in that traditional structure we have. I think we're going to lose the pyramid structure of society over the next 100, 200 years. I, we got 2000 years, so, yeah. you know, we're, <laughs> we can get to it. But I do think it's, it's we're really reaching like the growing pains period of yeah. what's happening now. And it ain't going to be the way it was. So, thankfully, uh, <laughs> and, it, and you're right, people do calm down. Um, Daniel, go ahead, fire away. Well, you know, uh, from my perspective, evolution isn't a theory, it's a fact. But you know, when that when that fish crawled up on the beach, he said, What the f is going on here? You know, <laughs> okay, <laughs> where, 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 you know, I, I am as hopeful as you guys are, but I, I okay. believe that whatever is happening, we're just at the beginning. Um, oh, yeah. I, I think I think that everybody's kind of hoping, you know, six months from now, you know, everything's going to turn around and come back. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I've, I've studied to some degree uh, uh, Hopi, uh, Native American mythology, and the, the, Ho the Hopis, most, most Native Americans talk about, you know, three worlds have, have existed before this one. Um, and, and they've we, we know of one. I mean, the Bible, the Bible tells us about one of them. We, they, no, they don't talk about the other two. Um, but uh, all the archaeology that goes back and finds, you know, artwork that should be in the MoMA from 35,000 years ago tells us that uh, we're not the first intelligent species to be on this planet. And so I guess the point I'm trying to make is uh, with what the Hopi say is that they say that this time the third world is going away, even as the fourth world emerges. And that's exactly what's happening. That's what we're experiencing. Th that third world's not coming back. We're not going to have that normalcy back again. We're going to have to find our way, uh, you know, really learning through Uranus and Taurus with what's essential and Pluto and Capricorn and really getting grounded and substantiating ourselves. We're going to have to figure this out to move forward because we are dealing with not just 250 years of, of American history or, you know, 6,000 years of, of planetary history, we're, we're, we're dealing with, you know, a planet, the planet itself is changing. Uh, the planet is not just a big rock, you know, flying through space. It's, it's alive, just like we are. We're connected to it. What happens to it happens to us. Uh, the Schumann residences, and if you follow them, have been off the scale. Um, for months now, they're, they're, it's just wild. The, 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 the earth itself is, is going through its changes. And because we are part of that earth, earth, the sphere, if you would, that, that same, you know, uh, universe, it, 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 we're changing as well. Uh, but, you know, Aquarius, you know, Uranus is a disruptor. Uranus is an interrupter. <laughs> Um, everybody gets excited about, you know, the age of Aquarius, and they think it's going to be something out of um, um, Alice, not Alice in Wonderland, uh, the Wizard of Oz. Uh, it may get there, but we've got some other stages that we're going to pass through before we see that. Isn't that kind of interesting with Pluto going into Aquarius? Because Uranus is chaotic, and it 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 takes things down, but it doesn't help you rebuild them, whereas Pluto does. So no, Pluto no, going no, into Uranus. Uranus does. Uranus is the reinvention. 
but it doesn't but it's not the same kind of oh i'm going to take this away and uh, i'm going to bring in something new or help you to bring in something new like pluto does uranus is the of invention but it it's not kindly and honestly i know i'm crazy by most people's standards with this but i do see pluto as kindly because it gives you warning here i'm coming you know, and all it's saying is you've got to go with me on this because if you don't, I have to annihilate you. Sorry, but those are the uh, those are the choices. Do it or die. And I will. I'm going to trade. I'm going to trade Pluto. I want to trade Pluto with you. I will help I wanna you. Tra- re- I want to trade Pluto's with you because because my Pluto keeps pulling the rug out from under me. So, but I, that's I his job so because you're not going with it. That's the problem. You know. Uh, no, I. It's my favorite planet. I love it. I love. <laughs> how it comes in and offers you a possibility uh and, and all you have to do is say okay i will make the changes you are requiring of me and it's not hard you know it you don't have pluto does not have to be difficult it can be very easy the problem is we choose not to go with it yeah I, I will add one thing about Uranus. The difference I see between Uranus and Pluto, and I've often said this to my clients, when you get in a heavy Uranus transit, Uranus is about new ideas. It throws 100 new ideas at you. Mm-hmm. Your job is to pick which one of them are going to work for you. And that's what I think Lynn is talking about in terms of Uranus is not it's as kind. Like, here, 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 take this. Where Pluto will say, you know, you better get ready. We're going to we're going to be reborn. So I hope you're with me. Yeah. You know, so I, but I understand what you're all saying. It is bringing up new ideas. But then mm-hmm. I think Pluto helps helps us adapt to the new ideas. Yeah. In Earth. That's just one idea anyway. Um, we're, we're getting some huge transform. Obviously, transformation is, you know, Pluto and Uranus <laughs> change transformation. And with Uranus going through this, squaring Saturn, it's just left that, hasn't it? It's, but, you know, it's not quite gone out of it yet. And then Pluto coming into Aquarius for the first time next year, it's... In Aquarius, for goodness sakes, you know, Uranus is a uh, territory. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so it's it's all about change and transformation, huge. And um, I really think the structure of, of the ages does help that. And obviously the ancients meant that when, you know, so many thousands of years ago, they, they introduced the, the um, procession. Uh, the idea of procession, which works scientific. I mean, it's amazing. It works scientifically as well. And how did they know? But I think ju- that's incredible. But they had the, and the ancient Egyptians I'm talking about, had the idea that, as you just said, Daniel, that we're connected with the cycles. So the great cycle is what we're connected to as well. So when we're going to get a huge change come in, obviously we are going to react to the cycle, but also the cycle is sort of going to act, react to us, like mm-hmm. stars do, the planets and everything. But, but what I found interesting about, um, you know, the apocalyptic thing is we do have it so much in our psyches for 2000 years now. We've had this thing hanging over our heads, but but it is about the change of the age. But... Um, it's interesting too because Russia and China have been playing on that. You know, the Russia brought up the four horsemen of the apocalypse the other day, uh, the the first minister, and then China, the minister there, brought up um, Armageddon for goodness sake. So they're playing on our on our history. Yes. Yeah, yeah, they're doing it on purpose. But on the other hand, we have to be prepared for that because they are playing a big game with us, and and it's like the shadow. It's incredible but then you get the shadow with pluto coming up too that's another thing about pluto and aquarius we have to be aware of that we are going to get the shadow come into that because that is part of transformation so, amanda you had to say something amanda okay. yeah just kind of okay. going off of all of that um and naming that when i was in grad school i wrote a master's thesis about how apocalyptic imagery affects the psyche and how astrology can help us navigate that um, and I'm naming that here just to say, oh, wow, to be pithy about this subject is a lot. Uh, <laughs> but also because kind of like going off of what Michaela was just saying, apocalyptic mythology is not new, right? Like they're, they're even before the Christian era, it's part of the world's mythologies. But I think that in a lot of ways, it's different this time for, for two reasons. One is that we have technologies 
to accomplish our own annihilation. Yeah. Um, and we're very out of touch with the mythologies that help us orient to the full cycle, right? Like a lot of secular society gets stuck in the descent portion. Like if you Google apocalypse and look at images, you get like zombie video games, right? And so we don't have connection with the energy of, of resurrection and resurgence and all the regenerative energy, right? That we see in um, Plutonian mythologies essentially. And so mm-hmm. what I like to, you know, in terms of like working with people who are, who are grappling with what's happening, it's try to keep it as grounded as possible, right? And so astrology gives us so many ways to do that um, by getting to know ourselves better, by getting to like see our own shit and work through it um, so that we are kind of doing our part within all the collective shadow that's going on. And so using things like ritual, whether it's personal ritual, which gives us a container for transformation or collective rituals that can help us deal with, you know, the Saturn Uranus square or Neptune through Pisces. Um, Thinking about like Saturn and Aquarius, what is my civic responsibility? How do I contribute to the restructuring of the systems within the place where I live to try and make it so that we are more self-reliant, right? Then the then the Uranus and Taurus comes back in changing our relationship to body and land and resources. And I think it also does have to do with that, with Uranus and Taurus, re-examining our relationship to not just our own personal bodies and our somatic experience, but the the body of the earth, right? Because if we're learning how to use our resources in sustainable ways, and that helps that transition into a civilization that's hopefully more life-affirming. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's a huge challenge, but astrology helps so much, doesn't mm-hmm. it? To know and to be in touch with the cycles and connect ourselves to it with ast- with them, with astrology is yeah. priceless. That's it's the I best. Say. Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. Well, by, def- by definition, we, c- we literally connect ourselves to something that's much greater than ourselves. Mm. Uh, yes. and, yeah, and, and apocalypse doesn't mean the end. It actually means no. the revelation of what's been hidden. Right. Exactly. exactly. And actually tying into what it that way, as you said, especially with bombs around and especially as they're being actually threatened now, for God's sakes, uh, it's like, well, they're freaking out <laughs> or I, pretending I do, it's not at all. <clears throat> one the other. I do want to tie in something what Daniel said, you're talking about the Native Americans, but also in India, uh, I think we're currently in the Kali Yaga, which is like one of the you took the four different civilizations. So and it's also about rebirth that we're coming to the end of a cycle for rebirth. So. Uh, and just so you can put on my seatbelt and we'll see what happens when it's all over. So uh, I think we should, um, if we're kind of wrapped up, I'll move on to something a little lighter for the next question. Uh, you know, well, because some of these questions we obviously would go on for hours. Um, what is your take on planets being debilitated or in their fall or in their rulership? Do you think, like, do you think debilitated is that bad? Do you think rulership is that great? You know, and I, my opinion, I'll just start off with, um, you know, to me, like Mars and Aries, it's like, well, yeah, it's, it's an element, but get the hell out of their way. They're just going to come crashing through everything, you know, like the Kool-Aid man or something. Whereas sometimes I see things like um, I've seen people with Mars and Pisces and what they do is they, they're a compassionate warrior and they end up when they, battle somebody and i'm using those terms loosely they end up converting them to their side which is a perfect use of pisces in mars so uh i don't always look at the traditional debilitations or rulerships as necessarily automatically positive or automatically negative negative. and i'm just wondering does anybody have any particular thoughts on a particular rulership or debilitation that you figure is all wrong or you don't agree with it I'm going to get a little harsh here, so bear bear with me. I think it's it's bullshit, okay? Because um, what what I've learned working with evolutionary astrology is that there's lots of different levels of consciousness of people on the planet. And the way that the chart is going to work is the consciousness that's brought to it. Uh, the chart, when we look at a chart, it's two dimensional. We've got time and space, you know, flat on 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 the paper, on the page. There's a third axis that's brought to those two axes, and that's the consciousness that's brought to that chart. And that's going to determine how the chart works. 
you know, I've had people come to me and they said, oh, I have, you know, Mars in Libra. I happen to have Mars in Libra, you know, and, and you know, I, 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 I'm, I was never that great at sports. I mean, the girls didn't even want to pick me, okay? Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I didn't care. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a sports freak. That's just not who I am. But the point, the point being is, is that we all have exactly what we need. And that combination works. When, when people come to me and they say, well, somebody told me that this planet is in its detriment or is in its fall. It's like, I feel like they're staying. You know, I get, I get angry with the astrologer who told them that because they think there's something wrong with them. Right. You know, and that's, there you the go. Worst, yeah. that's the worst thing that could happen of somebody walking out of a session is to mm -hmm. think that there's something wrong with them. Um, we all have exactly what we need where we need it. And, and that's just the way it is. I, um, yeah. I, I can't see it any other way. I look at it, uh, I explain it like, you know, if it's in the in fall, this is in its least happy spot mm -hmm. rather than saying, oh, my God, it's in its fall. <laughs> and yeah. let's explore why your soul needed to come in with that. Mm. What was the purpose behind it? And that usually, you know, uh, levels it out. So it's not traumatic. Oh, my God, it's it's in fall. But oh, yeah. Why did I want that planet not to be as as, you know, dignified or powerful or whatever uh, as the other planets? So maybe there's a reason behind that for my personal evolution. I like sure. that. I like that. I mean, it's it's true. Like uh, people go, like, I have a Capricorn moon that's bad. It's like, no, it's like. You you definitely Capricorn moons feel all their emotions. It's just a matter of what they make them public or not. It doesn't mean you have no emotions, and okay. that's what I often feel the struggle when something is supposedly debilitated or fall. Like like Daniel said, they act like oh this you have this you know tumor on the side of you that you have to carry through you the rest of your life. And uh, I've been at times very pleasantly surprised by clients doing things with their chart that I would never have thought of. It's like oh great you're using mars okay that's perfect you know and, and you're working with your chart so yeah and you, dan you had a good way of putting it everybody's got what they need in their chart i like that a lot so, i tend uh, to think about it in terms i mean on the one hand like i know that planetary stability or planetary dignity is a whole technique that goes beyond like planets in detriment fall and rulership um and i think that there can be some benefit sometimes if a person's having a really hard time to use that to kind of validate their experience but generally speaking you know i have most of the planets in my chart in debility and i don't find it to be particularly helpful and i also think about it in terms of the fact that the greco-roman tradition and its, and its philosophies colored the interpretations of those planets and so sometimes when i think of like venus and scorpio as being in its fall i'm like i don't know is venus and scorpio in its fall or is it just venus really sick of having to be nice and diplomatic in the face of people who don't care about her and so she's getting very direct right and lashing out a bit you know it's so colored by the culture um yeah. but one way that i do find that technique really helpful is in mundane astrology because i'll notice that like when mars is transiting through libra people are just more passive aggressive, right? It, it tends to be like louder at that level. Whereas with a natal chart, you can work with it a lot more. It's not like set in stone. Yeah, it's yeah. totally different when you're doing psychological or evolutionary type astrology. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you're doing predictive or mundane, then I think it has more of a place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, I don't generally use it no, I, I've never have, but um, yeah, I don't like the 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 the, the thing about you know thinking something's I, I, in fall. Yeah, it, it's yeah. It doesn't seem relevant to me. I mean, my son's in Libra, so it's in fall technically, but um, well, like in a predictive a seven, so I'm done. <laughs> for in a predictive like situation, it can <laughs> give you insight into how well it's going to flow. Yeah, um, I mean, it likes so. to be in Libra, but it's in fall. I, I think it's fair to say that astrology, astrology works, so all astrology works, um, and a lot of it really depends on the 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 uh, um, skills, the the you know the skills of the the astrology themselves. You know, their 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 person skills to some degree, I guess, or you know, their training, or you know, their mentoring skills, or their their the the way that they can explain it, I guess. But it, astrology works, so all astrology works. Uh, it, it, and it really, it really depends on what it is that you want to know. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I always say I trust astrology, but astrologers not so much. <laughs> because <laughs> You know, because astrology is always right. It's just a matter of, right. they, yeah, they can read, people can read it or not. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I Very early on, I had a student do her boss and I happened to work in the same office. And I said, look, I'll follow up after she's done because I want to make sure it was done right. The guy came out like pale. He's like, I have nothing to live for. I said, what are you talking about? She told him with his, oh, your Neptune is, uh, Neptune is squaring your, your Venus. You can never trust your friends. It's like, what, what, how do you tell somebody something like that? <laughs> So I understand. It's like you really it's the skill of the person. Thank God she did not pursue astrology um, as a career. So, yeah, you really have to have a compassion and empathy and understanding of people to uh, to apply this stuff really well. I, th I think we have to have enough of our own life experience to be able to understand who's sitting in front of us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, exactly. uh, absolutely. Um, so if we're wrapped up with that, we can move on to something else, which is uh, actually Michaela, this is one of Michaela's questions. Okay. What helpful books do you recommend and why? Um, yeah, to get through these challenges. What, what helpful what? what? Did you say yeah, works? To get through these challenges, these stressful but, challenges we're going through in the apocalypse. <laughs> oh, you specifically regarding the, okay, the so-called apocalypse. Okay. So what modern books regarding the current situation would you, would you, uh, think are worthy of reading. Um, I would just say in, in a funny way for me, uh, I think it's Cosmos and Psyche, which is a tremendous book to get through, but it really lays out the patterns of the millennia and whatnot, that awareness, like it isn't always fun in games. Sometimes it gets crazy. Some, so you have this kind of long view of like the last thousand years and suddenly the, the current apocalypse doesn't quite maybe seem as horrible, not that it's gonna be fun, but it doesn't seem quite as horrible. That's what I would think would be a book that could help with that. So Cosmic and Psyche, if you can get through it, which because it's yeah. it's quite a chunk of a book, but it's it's pretty, it, it gives me a big picture and I don't feel quite so panicked, you know, uh, with the current situation, whatever it is that's getting to anybody. Hmm. Any other thoughts? Perhaps we have to get past the title of the book and, and kind of focus on the authors themselves. Um, and, and see who it is that, that we're attracted to, how they write, what they say. Um, it, it, there, there's so much information out there that, you know, I don't think we could even list 12 books and say, this is all you need. Um, oh, but I, but, but yeah. I, I, think it's, I think it's finding the teachers and what, and what they wrote rather than finding a specific book. I mean, sure, Rick Tarnas is, is, is the Dane Rudger of our time. I mean, there's no question about it. Um, but, he's, but, you know, I, I don't know that his work is applicable to sit down, you know, one-on-one -on -one with a client who comes right. to who's, who's lost a teenage child. You know what I'm saying? He's, he's going to teach you a lot about the cycles of history and how astrology, you know, um, relates to that. But it's it's not going to help you at all if, 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 with somebody who sits down and has a a life crisis, you know, right on their desk, and and how do you deal with it? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I can't I can't give definitive best, but I can give you two of my favorite authors, which are Joanna Macy's who Joanna Macy, whose work um, is dealing with how to transition through the paradigm shift that we're in and is very accessible, and then Adrian Marie Brown, whose books Pleasure Activism and Emergent Strategies. Um, are more about like tangible strategies for recreating um, communities. Could I ask you to put those two titles in the chat so I can? Yeah, yep. that would be good. Everyone yeah, that sounds really good. And I've not heard of either of those. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, put, them, put, I'll put them in the description oh, of the. Oh, of great. The Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I don't know if you've heard of a book called uh, Catafalk by. Um, Peter King, Kingsley is a really good writer on uh, mythology and um, on, on psychology, in fact, and spirituality, psychospirituality. But he wrote a book called Catafalk, and it's actually a commentary on uh, Carl Jung and his red book, really. And um, but he, he titles it Catafalk, Carl Jung and the End of Humanity. So that's not, you know, that's not to put everyone off. It's nice and chipper. Yeah, I'll sh yeah. <laughs> But I mean, it's actually very good. And it does talk about what Carl Jung really meant by his red book, which was about, you know, the end of the age of Pisces going into the age of Aquarius and what it would bring up for us that it would actually 
that it was our not facing the, you know, an ability to face the shadow that, that was at the heart of humanity's problem and that it would face the consequences of that come the end of the age. And that's what we were heading for. In fact, you know, very much in the two world wars and, and, and all of it and the, you know, what's gone on since then. So catafalque's excellent. And it, it, it's not, you know, it's not a downer, although it does sounds a bit, but it really does make you think about actually the psychology and what he meant and that we really do need to um, get a hold of always projecting the shadow um, like we do about, you know, the, the Nazis and all of that. Obviously the Nazis were terrible, but we also don't, didn't look at ourselves at all. I mean, not that we had anything to do with the Nazis, or, except we did have something to do with Germany accepting the Nazis because Germany was put down into a place where it was susceptible. And then the shadow crept up in Germany. And that's what does happen quite a lot and happens every time. And we seem to fall into the same old trap and we, it's not the same now, but we have fallen into the trap of the shadow again. And it's though the shadow has come up in order for us to get hold of it this time, because if we don't get hold of it, it does get worse every time. And that's where we find ourselves. So he's brilliant in talking about that. And then I recommend that catafalk. And also dispelling Wetico, which is, is um, Paul Levy's book. And he talks about the Native American Wetico, the mind virus, which is basically the shadow, you know, and basically the demiurge that the Gnostics talked about. The same thing, the mind, the unconscious that we're not aware of and that we need to be aware of because that's at the seat of our problems because otherwise, in, until we get hold of it, which is what we need to do now, it comes up so as you can, you can acknowledge it. And yeah, so yeah, that's what I recommend. A book that I find myself recommending a lot, especially because I'm noticing more and more people are just aware that they need to do shadow work, especially with this currently transiting south node in Scorpio. People are like, yeah, okay, I need to feel my feelings. I need to do my emotional processing. Um, there's a book called The Marriage of Spirit. I think it's been around since early 2000s, and it's written by Leslie Temple Thurston. And it's great because it gives you practical ways to actually sit down and do this work with journaling and like prompts and, and understanding it also from a logical way which I think the north node in Taurus can kind of help keep it keep it light like look at the shadow but with this this levity and this ability to say like I, I kind of have influence over what I'm experiencing even though so much is out of my control yeah. And it's it's really, really helpful. And I think too, with this upcoming Neptune retrograde, a lot of people will have this desire to really turn inward and um, do, do the inner work. So it's a really great book for that. That sounds good. Yeah, that's what you need, some practical way of getting hold of it because obviously it's elusive. You know, you know oh, go ahead. Yeah. And no, Michaela, you what you were saying, uh, you know, made me think of... Uh, you know, about Germany and bringing up the shadow and how we, you know, demeaned Germany. Uh, a while back, I read a treatise from someone talking about, you know, what makes people go bad. And basically, it's the isolation. They're being isolated from others and they feel lost. And, and I'm thinking that's exactly what you were saying, because they were isolated or, or you know, put off to the side. And so their response was to come to, you know, with the shadow as being the prominent vehicle for whatever they were doing. It's, it, it, and I'm not sure how that fits with astrology, but I'm thinking there's got to be some kind of a connection. And, and that makes some sense. Well, actually, Pluto was discovered in, the, in 1930 when actually Nazism emerged. Yeah. So it's very much to do with, with Pluto, I think. And Uranus, of course, was mm -hmm. gone into Taurus too. Mm -hmm. like yeah, said. which so, we're seeing now. So, yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah. I, I always see Pluto as that which cannot be ignored, which is government, mm -hmm. Nazism, mm -hmm. uh, the mafia, whatever you want to call it. But this actually, yeah. this discussion actually makes me think of a question that's not on the list. But, you know, we talk about Pluto going into Aquarius and Uranus banging around in Taurus. Well, in a short while, relatively speaking, Neptune's going to go into Aries. Mm -hmm. And I know it's very happy right now in Pisces, although it does seem to be a little, uh, I have mixed feelings about what it's doing to us because some of us are clearly living lives of delusion. But yeah. I'm wondering what, what do you think your take is of, Neptune, Pluto goes into Aquarius, the next thing that happens, Neptune goes into Aries. 
any poetic thoughts of what that might be, not, you know, just briefly? It unsettles me um, because Aries is such a personal archetype and, um, you know, the range of beliefs in the world is already so diverse. I, I can't imagine it getting any more individuated than it already is. Um, I, I, I almost feel that it's going to, um, you know, Aries, first of all, is the god of war. Uh, we, we, we can't forget that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Neptune is, um, has very loose boundaries. Uh, so it, you know, from, from, as Neptune moves from Pisces to Aries, I, th I think that that's a greater shift than, you know, Pluto, you know, move, moving in from Capricorn to Aquarius. I mean, it's huge. It's, it's, it's a total turnaround. It's, it's going from water to fire and it's not comfortable Neptune is not going to be comfortable in Aries, and it's a long transit, and it's it's going to be at the same time that that uh, Uranus moves into Gemini. So you know we're going to have all this intellectual stuff, um, you know, that's really going to foment. You know, there's an inconvenient truth, you know, just as an aside, that every time you know I I I'm, I'm looking ahead at those planets, so I've I've looked at it for quite some time. But you know, it's an inconvenient truth, and I, th I think it was Austin Coppock who pointed this out that every time the United States, uh, that uh, Gemini has gone into uh, Gemini, the United States has been at war. Uh, the American Revolution, the Civil War, and, and World War II. And, right. and we're, you know, the 84 years is coming around again. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's, very, it's quite unsettling. And you know, when, I, when, I, when I look at the transits, the Neptune opposition that's going on, which happened you know, in the years prior to the Civil War, and the Pluto return, which happened at the American Revolution, um, it tells me that here in our country, in the United States, we are about to revisit both of those times in history. And January 6th was not some flash in the pan. Uh, and, you know, I, I am as heartened and as excited about what the um, uh, U.S. Uh, Select Committee on the January 6th, the com com you know, attack is, is all about. But, but there's part of me that says, what is this going to instigate? Uh, because all those people who came out, all those, and then they're disenfranchised. And, you know, I understand why they're disenfranchised. I understand why they're angry. I don't believe in QAnon, but I understand where they're coming from. Okay. I, I didn't go to the Capitol and, you know, smash windows, but I, I can understand how somebody could get that angry and do that. Yeah. So, certainly, you know, with with a role model like they had, you know, being being you know rallied and 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 you know urged on, but that notwithstanding, um, that's why I keep saying we're we're just at the beginning of all this. You know, it, we're we're just in the first days or weeks of the changes that are occurring in our country and on the planet. Uh, you brought up China and Russia. Um, you know, China, China is, has, um, has a 20-year plan, which, which would blow your mind, okay? And they're, 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 they're stepping through it with, with such um, precision uh, that, it's, that it's really quite, quite unsettling. You know, we, we live in a vacuum. We have never had an international war in our boundaries, Never. 9-11 you know, was the first one. I don't think that that was international, but that's just my opinion. Um, but the point being, we have, we, we have been insulated for 250 years. We have not experienced what you have experienced in England. We have not experienced what, what has happened in Europe or certainly in Ukraine. Um, we, we are babes in the woods, guys. Um, yeah, the last we, big deal was the Civil War, right? when we had anything actually happen on our area but it wasn't international it was internal it, so there were more more american men died at gettysburg than on d-day oh really um, so if really, i can I, jump in at that kind it, of the the thread of um new beginnings i believe that neptune and saturn are going to be conjunct in 2025 on the aries point so at zero degrees of aries hmm. um and i don't necessarily have an interpretation worked out of that but um, I think about when they were in their closing square was in 2016. Um, and in the US, that was a pretty definitive year in terms of the elections that year and a turning point. And one of the ways that I think about 
Neptune and Saturn and hard, hard aspect to each other is that it has the quality of bringing, bringing dreams to life, right? Like material reality. And a lot of times when we're talking about collective issues, it is the most unconscious um, dreams or fears that take on a lot of gravity. Mm-hmm. And so that cycle is coming to a close. Um, and like the word that keeps coming to my mind is incineration. And, and I am choosing to look at it more metaphorically, right? Mm-hmm. But the incineration of beliefs that aren't working, maybe um, it can also have qualities of contagion. And with Aries, we're going to be talking about, you know, courage, anger, hatred, um, mm-hmm spontaneous healing and things like that. So I'm definitely interested in seeing how that closing of that cycle feeds into the Uranus and Gemini and Pluto and Aquarius. Yeah. You know, fa- fascism is not a, a new, you know, something new that's to the United States. Charles Lindbergh was like the unofficial ambassador to the Third Reich. Uh, they, they, there's so much of American history that we, we have really just buried because we really didn't want to hear it. Um, but they're they're still here, okay? They're still here. Um, we had a, we had a we had a force Prescott Bush to stop dealing with the Nazis, and he's the beginning of the Bush family that brings us the Georges and the and the oil industry. But he he didn't even want to stop dealing with the Nazis. We had to tell him to stop. So yeah, I understand what you're saying there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all coming out in the wash, isn't it? <laughs> all at once, it would seem. Yeah. Um, it's, it's there. Um, yeah. so, uh, I didn't mean to cut you off, Jenny. I was just adding to what you said, uh, you know, shall we move on to another question or what do you, what do you think people, are we done with this one? Neptune that's and Aries. Something, that's something lighter. Um, no, I, think I agree with you. I think it, and, and that about war, obviously Aries, you know, war, it is, um, it, it could be, the, you know, the, the delusion of war, the aggrandizement of war, thinking it's such, you know, a great nationalistic thing, uh, a lot of nationalism going on, maybe, you know, uh, I think it, it, yeah, exactly. I think it sort of echoes the other transits that are coming together the other cycles it's all one big cycle and it's you know it is looking like a huge confrontation but hopefully well it will it, i'm sure it will end well it just depends what happens in you know in the book ends might, that might be okay the end of the book <laughs> bookshelf but what's in the middle is what's a bit worrying well, with the with the other uh, planets in air signs, it might not be a physical battle. It could be, you know, um, computer kinds of things, uh, um, you know, subterfuge. Oh, 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 yeah. yeah. Air signs are ideas and opinions. Yeah. A war of ideas, huh? Okay. Well, we got that going right now, sort of in the between the left and the right in America, and the. The vaccinators and the anti-vaxxers and all of this. I'm not asking any opinions on that. I'm just discussing general. Don't want to kick that one up. Uh, but uh, so let's uh, let's take something a little lighter. I'm just curious. Among your clients, what transits in their chart bring you clients more often than others? And I know for me, I get a lot of Saturn transits and I get a lot of Pluto transits. Um, you know, because part of the fun of an astrologer is you, before they even see you, you look at their chart and they go, oh, I know where they're coming here, you know. Are there, and I'm just curious, uh, do you have similar things? Do you have maybe you attract different kinds of clients? Do you, What do you see as the, stand, the typical thing that brings clients to you, astrologically speaking? This is such a good question because it makes me reflect on what I must be putting out energetically because I'm realizing a lot of people come to me when they're having some sort of nodal opposition or a square to the nodes or a nodal return. And they're always at this point where they're like, okay, past future, kind of at a battle or a tension with themselves and the collective. And and they're having to make a really specific decision about moving forward. And there's always some wild node story, which is interesting because I I definitely study the nodes, of course, as an evolutionary astrologer. Um, And I do feel like there's always ritual or there's strategy with the nodes. And maybe that's what's coming through like people want to know 
how can I take action? Like what would be the thing to look at if I'm not sure what's going on? And I, I generally think that looking at the North node and understanding the planetary ruler of, of the nodes and things like that, it, it usually gives people something tangible to work with. Mm -hmm. In, in relation to that, I mean, I have I'm, I have a lot of planets in Capricorn, midheavens in Capricorn, and I have uh, Moon square Pluto, and I'm attracting Saturn, Saturnine and Plutonian issues all the time. You know, yeah. not always. Sometimes somebody comes in with Neptune, although usually just wandering by accident when they're getting a Neptune transit. But uh, it does bring in you know, like I don't see people with their Jupiter return. I don't get people getting that kind of stuff. It's it's more like the hard lessons for me about a particular Saturn and Pluto. Anybody else notice anything in their particular practice of what draws certain clients to? I noticed Pluto, Uranus, the nodes, and sometimes progressed new moons. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, yeah. yeah. I mean, they do seem to reflect, don't they, on the astrologer. So it's, some, it's as though something that's coming to your attention through what the client is bringing. Definitely. I yeah. Get that a lot. <laughs> I mean, the only time that doesn't really happen is when somebody gives an astrology chart as a, as a gift certificate, like a gift, and they really have no reason to come to an astrologer, except that they got this gift. So I often find it's like, well, I'm just here to tell you about your chart. Okay, go. Goodbye. Oh, three years from now, watch out for Saturn. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> kind of thing. Um, That's you know, a good yeah. idea. Certificates. Don't think of that. Yeah, I, I'll do it. I, I, I print them up and it's like, if you want to give a oh, gift to it, you know, to somebody, I, I did a, I'm a graphic designer, so I made a certificate that people can mail to each other. And uh, I don't have any expiration dates. Um, yeah. And sometimes they pay me for it and then the person never shows up and they go, okay, I'll take it. I'm not going to refund, you know, I, I, if they ask for it, I'll, if they ask for it, I'll refund. But if they don't, and I've even contacted some people, they said, no, when, when they get the reading, that's all that matters to them. I said, okay. So, uh, but yeah, I, gift certificates. I, I find, you know, I agree with all of you. I, I think that I find that clients show up either when they're in uh, some kind of transition or they're in crisis. And, uh, you know, I, the first thing I do is I look at their Uranus cycle. I look at their Saturn cycle. I look at their Jupiter cycle. And, you know, nine times out of 10, they're having a Jupiter return. They're having a Uranus square. They've got a, a, you know, a, a Saturn square opposition. And, and it's triggering something in them, it's triggering a life change. And they don't know how, how to respond to it because they're being, you know, changes, change is the last thing that most people want to do. Um, you know, we, our moon just wants to be our moon, which just wants to be nice and familiar and safe and, you know, or, or, or you know, at home by the fire and, you know, with a, with a you know, a cup of, of hot <laughs> chocolate. So, um, you know, when, when, any, when any kind of a change comes along, a death, a divorce, uh, bankruptcy, uh, the loss of somebody dear to them. That's that's generally when they come in. They, the people rarely come in, you know, because um, oh, I'm getting married, so I want to know, you know, about my marriage. I don't, I don't get that stuff. They, they come when the marriage ends, or the marriage is in trouble, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. So. Cool. I've actually had a, a couple of really fun readings where people wanted to know a great day to get married. And that's about it. Yeah, just electional. the electional astrology. Which I, is I, really could, I could see that too. Or, or, you know, like, or you get you know, the medical stuff, you know, I need an operation. When should I do it? You know, you get those kinds of things too, for sure. Um, but, it, but it's got to be some event in their life that's triggering them that brings them in. It's, yeah, it's and really, God, you know, they just decide, oh, I'm going to go get an astrology reading. You know, it's, it's not like yeah. going to the dentist. Um, exactly. <laughs> um, okay. Um, now, Mikkel, I don't know if you asked this in reference to the apocalypse, but you were asking, do does anybody use tarot cards or some other method to access the unconscious? Do you uh, actually? I know I'm interviewing somebody in my show in a couple of weeks that refers to herself as an astro tarot reader, but I'm just curious: does anybody use tarot cards or anything else other than? you know, basic astrology when they're looking at a person's chart. I use, uh, I use tarot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I use tarot. And within the past couple of years, I've delved into gene keys and human design just because I find it really fun to look at where it connects. Mm -hmm. I use the Akashic records. But, mm. you know, I don't I don't normally combine astrology and that they're very different readings, but there are times in which um, 
particularly during an Akashic record reading, when I say, you know, do you mind if we look at your horoscope? Because that'll be easier to target or there's a reason to look at it. And then there have been a few times in which someone has contacted me for an astrology reading. And, I, you know, I'm preparing for it because I do a lot of prep before they get here. And I'm not getting anything in answer to the things that they're talking about. And then, like, for one woman example, uh, she said, you know, I'm moving and I want to talk about that. And I'm like, oh, okay, because, you know, I'm looking for a time to move. But in fact, she wasn't looking for a time to move. She was looking for, should I move? Which I don't think astrology really can address. I mean, it can tell you, well, this is a good time, maybe not a good time. But uh, I, you know, so I explained to her this would be better if we did a different kind of reading. And that, you know, uh, so sometimes I'll bring them one into the other. But and and it's with Akashic Records particularly that I notice uh, a similarity of questions coming up rather than reading in, in horoscopes for me. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, I hate when they come in and they want a decision made for them. It's like, no. No, I'm not doing that, you know. Um, yeah, sure. Any any other comments on the topic of uh, tarot or I, I, me personally? I'm a huge fan of the Seth material. I've read it forwards and backwards, and I've lectured on it. So a lot of times, I'll bring in the concepts and underlying philosophy of Seth into what I'm teaching, which basically boils down to you create your own reality. You know, uh, nothing exactly new into anybody's you know philosophical thing. So I'll often. Uh, without necessarily saying, oh, by the way, Seth says, I'll bring the concepts in and, and, and couch my astrology reading in terms of you You have the power here, you know, and this is what you're dealing with. Um, yeah. That's the way I tend to do it. Yeah. So, yeah, I think anything that can help tap into the unconscious and help, you, help the intuition, um, you know, I think it's a good thing. It's a shame the rider weight pack i'm I, I was put off that for years i thought it was old-fashioned and sort of do you know fatalistic and and um with death cards and devils and all of that but now i really respect it i can see all the symbology in there that doesn't it's not what you think it is so um you know i think i i, I use that a lot now yeah okay, it's a okay. um next question i'm going to ask um this is looking into your your files what are some of the surprises you've learned along the way that deepened your understanding of a particular, you know, thing in the chart? And um, the only one I can think of at the moment, uh, I was I had this woman's chart. She, creativity was all over her chart, Neptune, all these things. And uh, she seemed to be a bit of a doormat. And she said she never had time to do things. And I was like, well, why don't you try taking a class in painting? I'm just trying to push her in a direction. She said, don't, don't try to master it, just do the Neptune thing. Everything I suggested, she had these elaborate excuses why she couldn't. And then what finally dawned on me about two thirds of the way through the reading is that she's using her creativity to keep herself from doing all these things. It's like I found so much of what she was doing was extraordinarily creative, but they were all excuses to keep herself from doing these things. So sometimes I find that the surprise of like, I wouldn't have used my chart that way, but OK, I can see what you're doing here. Um, and do those kind of things pop into your life that uh, uh, in your clients that make you stand out to you as like, oh, wow, I didn't even realize this. Yeah. 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 Not the particular transit she was having. What, um, what no, was... It, was just, it was all over her chart, creativity, but she okay. never really manifested it. And I just yeah. remember trying to encourage her because yeah. it seemed like in her chart, what I recall, I don't remember the planets, but she seemed to be a bit of a doormat and never had time to do anything for herself yeah. so i was trying to say like well just do something here and she kept coming up with excuses of why she basically had to be a doormat um yeah. and they were creative but uh sometimes you know you end a reading with just sort of like well they they threw their money away you know not really but i feel kind of like you know i put it on myself to a degree it's like i should have tried harder but some people don't want to be reached that's the other side of being I, don't know, though. I mean just because it doesn't seem like it at the time they might have gone away and and then something might have occurred to them from what you gave yes Yes, I. Yeah, I always hope for that. Exactly, exactly. You know. Definitely. Um, any other surprises when you did a reading and somebody like surprised you with something? Because uh, I got another one. If nobody else is going to come with it, go ahead. No. Oh well, well I, you go ahead with yours. I had a thing. Okay. Again, I don't remember the exact details, but I remember 
this woman had very strong Neptune moon stuff. And so I saw, oh, there's no mother here. She sort of faded away. But she also had indications of her chart of a very strong mother. And I remember I turned to her actually in the reading, this is about 12 years ago, and I said, I don't get this. I said, I see you have a very strong mother and a missing mother, and I don't quite understand how this manifested. And she was wondering, she goes, oh, I can explain that. She was given away at birth by her birth mother, was adopted by a mother who was more Saturnine and kind of not strict necessarily, but Saturnine. What was interesting is, though, when she was around 30 or so, she contacted her birth mother. They met outside of the town where her birth mother lived. I'm so happy you've turned out wonderful, but you can never talk to me again. My entire family would never understand you. And boom, she was gone again like Neptune. And I just thought it was really fascinating to see how clearly there was a Neptunian mother and yeah. a very Saturnine mother for the same person. But I wouldn't have thought of that before she um, said, oh, I can explain that. So, <laughs> yeah, wonderful. You know. Yeah, that's how it works. It's great. That question yeah. didn't do much except get me to talk about myself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but that's, that's, it's very good because that is what happens. Sometimes you don't understand something, but then it, it, it makes perfect sense when, when it's, you see it come out of the chart and you see, oh, well, that's how it works. Now, one yeah. of the reasons I realize that Pisces Mars can be used useful is I, this woman had a son who was around 14 and he had Uranus trining the Mars in Pisces. And uh, he was the one that found a way to, convert everybody to his side. He never got into fights or anything. He used this natural compassion. And, and I think the moon was, uh, the, uh, Uranus, I think might've been in Scorpio. I'm not, my, my mind isn't quite clear on it, but he used all this stuff to work really well. So sometimes you learn more about astrology from clients. And that's where I realized he was really clever. He didn't get into fights. He was, he was the nerdy kid, but everybody was his friend because he went around with this Mars and Pisces, converting them to his side, you know? <laughs> Uh, Mars and Pisces in the third. Okay, good. That should be good for peacemaking, I suppose. Retrograde. Ah, uh, okay. Um, it's, it's Neptune in Pisces too. It, it has been slippery, hasn't it? To say the least. Yes. It yes. <laughs> um, um, so, and it's of course, if that hits your chart or you see clients, it, it's 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 different every time. It does seem like it's got a different. Has everyone found that that it's sort of got so many it's like a kaleidoscope there's so many different aspects to it it, I, it su surprises you every time in particular i think you know we we're also in a society that doesn't encourage neptune at all um yeah. and yeah. so uh spirituality in many situations has either gone completely right wing and, and locked up or else just become really vague i had one client talk to me that well, she regularly communicates with Jesus Christ and she sees this person. As, and I tried to explain to her, it's like Neptune is letting you create these images. It's you're yeah. the one with the ability. Stop pretending it's somebody else or, or at least if you're going to create somebody else, know that you're in control of it. And that's what I find the trickiest part about Neptune, particularly because, you know, I got enough Earth in my chart to, to create an avalanche. But I recognize the practical uses of Neptune and uh it's tough to kind of explain you know magic is good you can use it <laughs> for daily yeah. life you know yeah. as long as it's grounded as you say you need, do yeah. need to, to ground it really and, and i do find the current generation the ones in the early 90s that had neptune and capricorn and uranus and capricorn are looking for that i get a lot of these young people coming in looking for practical applications they don't want to go meditate in the mountain for seven years to see god they want to use their intuition right now on the street corner yeah. do i turn left do i turn right do I take this job? So yeah. there is the younger generation looking to create that practical, practical mysticism is what I always call it. So yeah. uh, <laughs> that's right. I mean, just quickly, I had a Neptune transit because you're saying how it surprises you. And that because my ascendant's Pisces and it went right over my ascendant. When I saw that, I thought, oh, no, <laughs> well, but, but it was where it wanted to be in my. And I thought, well, that's really going to activate my ascendant. And um and I, everything started leaking. I had leaks everywhere, <laughs> it was so literal. And then I had a, a pool and the pool uh, cracked uh, and, the, and everything you did to try and repair everything, the leaks, then the electricity went because of the water. Uh, there was a flood and there was another flood. <laughs> it's like water no. everywhere, literally. And then the fish pond dried up and, um, 
And I had had a fantasy for a long time of the pool. I, I really hated the pool. It was only for guests, for bed and breakfast sort of thing. And I, I wanted to make a pond. I thought it would make a wonderful pond, being Pisces, right? <laughs> and then the fish pond dried up and the fish had nowhere to go. And I thought, okay, I'm sick of this pool and I can't mend it and I'm going to put the fish, I'm going to make it a pond finally. I'm, you know, to hell with it. I don't care if the customers don't like it. And uh, I, I did, I made it a fish pond. And now it's like a sort of a sanctuary thing. It's become a, a sacred space. And, um, and it's, it's amazing. It's like, mm. wow, that made me do that. You know, Neptune, thanks. I had Neptune tr um, trining my ascendant. Uh, I have a cancer ascendant. And I thought, oh, that should be very interesting. It was horrible, horrible. Mm. I had no clue what was going on anywhere. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I had. A, I was very surprised by it not being anywhere near what I was thinking it was going to be. It never is, is it? Never. Comes. No. Yeah. I had but an illusion. There's, yeah. there's usually a bonus there. Something. It's spiritual. I didn't find one. <laughs> no, I didn't oh, well. find one. <laughs> Must be I had a friend who said when when Neptune crossed his sun and ascendant, which were conjunct, he said it was a whole year. I didn't have to buy any drugs. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> he stopped smoking pot, stopped doing drugs. So, uh, yeah, Neptune's a Neptune's a wiggly one. It's hard mm -hmm. to get a finger, hand on. And now, um, of course, it's going retrograde. And your question, I don't know if you want to do that question about retrograde planets, about the shadow. Well, let's say, since we're talking about it, why not? Um, you know, I, I hear a lot of astrologers talking about the shadow period of retrograde planets. And um, it's something I've only heard in the past. Like, I didn't hear it in the beginning when I first started studying. Now people are saying, like, well, if it's retrograde from 20 to 18, then when it's 18 to 20 before and after, it's considered, it's like almost they're tripling the time the planet's retrograde. And um, I tend to look askance at that. It's not something I'm really totally into. I mean, it's like, great. So you want to expand Mercury retrograde to like three times bigger than it normally is, you know? Uh, so I'm just wondering, do, do you see in your experiences a strong case for the shadow period as people call it for retrograde planets? And I'm I speaking do. more inner. Go ahead. I Go do. Ahead. I definitely do. I have Mercury stationary direct, uh, stationary <laughs> retrograde at the very bottom of my chart. So I watch, you know, Mercury <laughs> things. Yeah. And I, I ha am convinced that Mercury gives you like th three chances to look at an, uh, at an issue. You know, the first time it goes over, you, s you see, you know, what it's about. When it goes back over it, you see um, a, a potential solution. And then when it goes back over it the third time, you get to implement the solution. And I see that with, with Mars retrograde. I see it um, to some extent with, you know, Saturn, Neptune, you know, with all of them, that it's mm -hmm. a, it's a three-part um, uh, working out, yeah, yeah. yeah working yeah. out of an issue, you know, yeah. it, it becomes evident and then, then you think of a, a solution and then you implement the solution. Yeah. I, I always I always jokingly tell people that if Pluto is doing that, it's like it runs you over, it backs over you again, then it drives <laughs> over you a third time. And hopefully by the third time you figured out what's going on. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, I have, a, Go ahead. I have a stationary direct Mercury at the bottom of my chart. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> yeah. It, we should we should talk about this. Yeah. Well, and I have a cancer rising too. So yes, oh, we should. <laughs> yeah. Uh I I, th I do pay attention to the shadow period to a small extent. Um, because you know, not just with Mercury with but with any of them, because it can be if you stick with oh, the shadow period, Mercury is the problem because it's three times a year at least. Uh you can't do anything. You know, you'll you'll never do anything. So um, I, it's like a hangover. You know, it's done, but oh, it's not quite done. Oh, I'm carrying it around. When's it going to be over? But um, you know, so I usually look at. I don't pay that much attention to the to the beginning prior to the actual retrograde station. Uh, you know, but it is slowing down, and there's stuff, and that's a shadow period in itself as well. But 
I do pay a great deal of attention to the uh, aftermath of when it has gone through the cycle and, and now it's direct, but it's not up to speed. So I, and because if you do, and I, I just did something on this, that if you just paid attention to the whole mercury thing, you've got like 61 days or so three times a year in which you can't do anything. So I usually look at, well, when is it up to speed? Not when is it out of the shadow, but, you know, is it is it doing its normal speed? And that's when I say, OK, I'm ready to go back into the waters, so to speak, and do whatever this planet uh, is is about, because I feel safe. It's uh, it's up and running. Well, yeah. okay, so I, I think that, that we have to keep going, you know, no matter what. I, I, yeah, I, I don't allow. I mean, I. I want to stop and say, I'm going to wait until it, you know, until it gets back retrograde. But, but I think it's all part of the natural process. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, the, the retrograde is, is part of a review in the natural process of, of things. Yeah, you know, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Alfie, Alf, Alfred Levy, Levy, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Perhaps you've heard of him. Levoy, I think is what it is. Okay. Yeah. He did this blog where he pointed out he did a year. He marked all the time Mercury was retrograding in the shadow. Then he added in every period when the moon is void, of course, and basically said there's like five days a year you can do anything. <laughs> you know. But I, I do think we have a lot of um, Western cultural Christian Jewish guilt, like everything has to be negative, everything has to be a problem. And we we tend to look at it that way, you know. So I think we tend to like to heap heap more problems on top of each other. Um, so yeah, I I, I don't do that much with some of these things. My personally, the shadow. Interesting. I mean, I noticed something about actually Neptune going direct. Uh, sorry, it's it's gone stationary, isn't it? Yeah. Stationary retrograde now, but then when it goes direct, which will be in December, um, then but it will take until I think it's March in 2023. Yeah, March 2023 until it gets to its shadow back back to the uh -huh. degree started on that's it isn't it that's the shadow thing um and actually the day it it actually gets back to that degree is when pluto goes for the first time into aquarius which uh -huh. is i think that's really interesting um so we're sort of entering into that period now as it's gone retrograde we've got the period until december and then when it goes direct we'll be heading for really the pluto and ingress into aquarius for the first time so I can tell you, I can, I can give you one, one funny, well, interesting example of a, 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 a stationary direct Neptune. And I believe it was, it was either square my moon or uh, opposite my sun because they're in square. But I, I and I, I'm pretty sure it was my sun, but I felt with that, that, um, that direct turning I felt this a physical, a, a very somatic feeling of a boat turning around. It was like I, my body just felt this thing of a, a ship riding, huh. you know, and, and, and I mean, it's probably the only time that that's happened, but it was, it was very um, visceral and, and very, um, you know, yeah. I, I, I definitely felt it. You know, I felt like, you know, the, the, the my my ship is finally turning around. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's positive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, that's good. <laughs> you know, we have about five or ten minutes left before we're up to about ninety minutes, so I don't want to get too caught up in it. But I'm just wondering, you know, quickly, uh, how has your approach or feeling about astrology changed or shifted from your early days to now? You know. Uh, I felt that for me personally, I felt in the early days, I was just sort of working this machine and I was very proud that I knew how to work this machine, but I do find over the years, it's become much more uh, softer, intuitive, uh, loose, not that I don't ignore the facts, but that it's become second nature to me, you know, uh, like my brother's a photographer. And at one point he said, he got past worrying about all the settings in the camera because he just knew what he was doing. And I feel I've reached that point, you know, where I can just look at it without worrying too much about is this exactly one degree or whatever. And I'm feeling very comfortable with counseling and, and more relaxed. That's what's happened for me over the years, just that sense of uh, 
relaxing a little bit and not feeling I have to, you know, mark every planet and every degree down and get a feeling for the chart. Anybody else have any sense of what's changed for them over the years? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, I was thinking of the Saturn cycle of seven years it taking to really master something and it actually going through all of the cells in your body. And then after that, it's integrated. And I do think that for me, that was a big shift. That's when I really noticed it's like, oh, I can play a little bit more with this. And that's when I actually started bringing in the extra tools like the tarot and, and the other things. And I, I noticed that it's like that book by Bernadette Brady, The Eagle and the Lark. Like when you have the technique down, then you can play. Just like you need to learn a language to be a poet. You need to really understand the technique to play music, but then it gets to be really fun. And I kind of think about that with Saturn too. It, it, I think once people have those kinds of relationships with Saturn, like you find mastery in something, then it gets fun. Then it's not like the hard drudgery work. Yeah. And, and I notice, especially in this day and age, like there's a lot of bouncing around for a lot of people. Like they'll try something for like a year and then they're like, this is really hard. I'm going to just stop this thing. Like they'll kind of come up against that Saturn wall of like, this isn't for me. Um, but if you stuck with it long enough, you'd probably become quite masterful. So I, I really view astrology is definitely like that. I'm so excited to see what it feels like to go through an entire Saturn cycle with astrology. <laughs> Daniel, you were going to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When, when I when I first started doing readings for people, I, I felt that I had to be some kind of astrological wizard. And I had to tell them every <laughs> single thing I could think of to tell them about their charts so that when they left, <laughs> they would be wowed. And, right. And, 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 and as I've aged, I, 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 I follow their lead. I, you know, I, first of all, I, I, I ask all of my clients for an intake form. Um, I'm not some prognosticator where, you know, they come in and I'm going to, you know, magically tell them everything about themselves because it, it doesn't work that way. I have to know something about them. It's not about the what's, it's about the why's. So that's, so that's, that's how I approach my readings. And I have learned to um, distill what we talk about down to why they're sitting in front of me, um, not not to try and fill their head with every single nuance about every planet in their chart, but rather to have them, you know, leave with an understanding of the an answer to their question or the situation that they came in with. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, actually. Uh, but you're quite right. When you start, that's what you want to do. You, you think you've got to cover every single thing. And right. it's impossible. And, and it's not even necessary because you can just say you can find if you can find that one thing, that one uh, bit of information that will just do it for them. Suddenly it, something, everything falls into place. And that's what you're look, really looking for. That one thing that actually nutshells it. Their you know, what, what, what I've heard, for the, actually, the first time I ever read for anybody, and it has repeated a number of times through the years, they said to me, nobody's ever told me that. And that's, yeah. and that's what I have learned to focus on. What is it about themselves that they really don't know that mm. they need to Exactly. That's, that's a very good point. If, if, they're, re if they're receptive to hear it, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that, that's, that's the big point. Yeah, it's like making it person-centric, making it about right. the people themselves. Yes. Yeah. Right. But I, but I give them an intake form. I ask them about their mother and their father and their siblings and their work. And, you know, I get some background because otherwise I can spend the first 30 minutes of their money trying to forget what the hell is going on in their life. This way, I, you know, when they sit down in front of me, I can zero right in on where we need to go. Yeah, mm. exactly. Um, that makes sense. I used to do like six pages of notes before every reading. Now yeah. it's down to about one page of just... So to shorthand for myself, so like make sure I get to these topics. But uh, I don't ask yep. for intake forms. So what? Go ahead. You gonna say, Lynn? I was gonna say, having lots of Virgo myself, I still do all those pages for me before I meet with somebody, just because I figured somewhere it's in the back of my head and it'll come out what I need. And then when they get here, or you know, these days on Zoom. Uh, I don't even think about that and just to you know, go with it. But that took me a long time to figure out. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It takes and a long time to get to that. The other thing, too, is I found myself narrowing my focus down. It's like I stopped trying to tell them everything. Like Daniel said, you're trying to tell every single thing about their chart. And, and I've discovered it's just um, career, relationships, health, 
finances and family. There's your five topics. And you can usually look at your chart and say, oh, this is going to be stronger. You know, maybe the moon's getting attacked by Saturn and Uranus. Okay, mom and family is going to be more tough. Um, plus so many techniques. Somebody gave me a whole lesson once in uh, derived houses. And uh, she was showing me how like, you know, oh, your grandmother really liked animals. And it's true that I watched what she did and it made sense. And there it was. And my grandmother happened to be the woman in the neighborhood that everybody took their animals to. My mother grew up with like 50 cats and dogs all the time. But then it becomes, and of what use is this information to the person I'm talking to? You know, sure, it's like, oh, look at me. I'm a magical astrologer. I can tell your grandmother like cats. So what, you know? So to me, it's like zero, as you say, person-centric. I don't know who said that, but that's that's the term I really like. I agree. Um, and I, I, yeah, yeah, and I, I can add two things. I ask people what they want, what they want me to focus on. And right. I also look at the transits. And I, I learned um, a, a while ago that you can tell by what, it, what transit is it within a degree of being exact, what the issue is at hand. Yeah. And that that has all that has always um, done me well in 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 you know in pinpointing what what the issue is along with what the person says they want to focus on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same here. Yeah. It, well, it becomes easier, doesn't it? The more you do it, to zoom in on that on 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 the what's actually the the heart of the issue. You just zoom in on it intuitively in the end. But like you said, um, you know, it's it's. Nora, it's about, um, you know, first doing get the technical right, and then you can start playing. But up until that you have, have done that, you can't. So you can't have fun with it. <laughs> and you can't, you can't, you have to have intuition as well to be able to zoom in, but it's your eye as well, isn't it? It's just doing loads and loads of charts for years. And then just your eye just goes straight to it. Yeah, I, I really honed that ability when I did some psychic fairs and I have like 10 minutes to read a chart. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, you know, and, and, you pick it up. It is intuitive. Oh, yeah. but I always, I don't know. Some of you know who Sam Reynolds is. He had been on the Bill Nye show uh, as an astrologer. And Bill Nye was, of course, trying to dismiss astrology. And he said, is astrology a science? And Sam said, uh, it's an interpretive art with science as its underlying painting. And I just thought that was really a wonderful way to put it. Of course, Bill Nye ignored it and just attacked him for it not being scientific. But, you know, what did you expect into the into the lion's den, so to speak? But uh, Danny, did you have something you wanted to add? I didn't want to. I, I, I cut my I cut my teeth doing 15 minute Pluto readings and psychic fairs. Wow. People would sit down cold wow. in front of me and um, I would I would read their Plutos. Huh. Mm. That's yeah. definitely a way to get in on the deep end. That's going yeah, yeah. diving in the deep end of the pool. So. Did you did you do their Plutos in terms of where they were located in their own charts or just no. Pluto by the sign or what did you do? How did you do that? Sign house and aspects. Oh, OK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you had a computer to instantly do their chart. Yeah, it was a solar okay. fire. Yeah. No, I just I'm just curious because, you know, yeah, people would, have I, different I would, ways I, of I, doing I stuff. Tell me their birthday, I'd bring her yeah. the chart. And yeah. uh, because, you know, again, for, you know, from the, the way that I work from any perspective, Pluto was the entry point into the chart. Once oh, you yeah. Pluto, you've got the whole chart. I knew that, too. Yeah. 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 Well, that sounds interesting. So that's a good thing to offer. I'll read your Pluto. Yeah. Right. I knew one woman. I saw her doing a, a reading at a psychic fair and. Uh, she was just reading from the ephemeris, taking a person's birthday and just looking up their day and using that. Obviously, she wasn't using the mirror so much, the mirror, the moon so much, but she was using it to trigger. Her. But everybody's got their own technique. We're just about at 90 minutes. So unless there's any last minute, something anybody would like to say or add to anything, we might want to wrap up in a moment or two. I would love to ask Robin, if you're willing, and I and don't mean to push, if you would uh, let us know how you experience that Mars and Pisces uh, retrograde. Did you say it was stationary as well? No, it's just retrograde. Oh, and it's in the third house, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Yeah, and it's got some squares in opposition to, to um, major wow. planets. So um, I experience it um, 
on different levels. On one level, it's frustrating because it's hard for me to put myself forward at times. Um, I, I hold back a lot. And then on another level, um, it makes it gives me a lot of intuitive ability to feel my way around things. Um, so, you know, it, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, it's it's all, I always find it good to hear who, when someone can explain a specific kind of situation because they're living it rather than, you know, just objectifying it. Right. Point it out of a book, yeah. Well, yeah. she had Neptune go over it. Yes, I just had my yeah. Neptune go over it. And that oh, was my God. Crazy. That affected my health and my immunity. Oh. Wow. Um, Hmm. Okay. I was just going to say in relation to that, I, I completely resonate with that, Robin, because I have Mars and Aries, but it's in the 12th house. Wow. So I really view it as the Aries Pisces combination. Mm -hmm. And it was really only when I came to evolutionary astrology that that layering of the houses as mm -hmm. having so much of that similar archetypal energy made right. sense for me because I was like, wait, Mars and Aries, like, <laughs> when, when am I like that? Like, right. maybe right. by myself? <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it definitely helps and I think it gives validity to to that um that methodology because I know some people have a lot of harsh judgments around the house system or like using the house as um an overlay of the archetype right but yeah I do works. I use it I find that it works a lot yeah, it, works. it just depends on how you're applying the astrology you know for a mundane astrologer or Hellenistic astrologer, you know, they don't have to use that. No, they're taking a different angle of the chart. And, you know, it, everything they're seeing is valid and real, but they're just looking at it in a different way. But I definitely see the validity of using the archetypes uh, in the houses as well as the sign. Yeah. I think yeah, the get, houses I, are very fluid. I, I, also. Use, I use the 12 letter alphabet as well. But, but um, re, if, after having read Deborah Holding, I also look at the houses from her perspective as well. And so, I, you know, you can look at it both ways and, and learn something different. All right. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, anyway. this has been fun. Um, and we'll do it and again in a couple, two, three months or something. We've been doing that four years. So well, the last one seemed to be stumbling around a lot before we got it to go this time. But uh, I hope you enjoy this as much as I do. I always love kicking around the planets and the uh, to, with the fellow astrologers and checking out different techniques. Um, Sue, do you want to just mention this is going to be up on Facebook right after we're done? Or it will post be it? on YouTube, YouTube? And, okay. and I will post the, the link on uh, Facebook. I will add, if there's anything else you want me to add to the description, just send it to me and I'll do that. Um, as far as like maybe how to contact you guys, I can, I can add that. Um, I, I do, I did make a list of all of the references, the book references and the, 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 uh, docu the documentary, um, but anything else that you want me to add, just, just uh, send it to me and we'll do that. And it should be up later, later today. Is the Facebook page New York, uh, Big Apple Astrology? No, that's no, mine. It's the, that's something else. Okay. Go ahead. No, what it's is the... The EA, EA Zoom meetings group. I, you oh, may okay. not be in it. I'll, I can add you to it. I'm not in it. No. Okay. I'm I'll, add, I'll add you to it. Okay. Thank you. Great. Right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you. Yeah. Really and, good. Uh, see you all in a few months. <laughs> this, was, this was a thank great you. discussion. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Just fun, you know? Yeah, yeah it, it was. Really Thanks fun. for joining us, Lynn. Thank you. And Thank everybody. You. We'll, see, okay. we'll see you in a couple of months. Okay. Bye-bye. And I'm going to watch Fog of War tonight. It's yeah. a great documentary. I'm good. Yeah. I, I sent you a message. You, gotta, on you know, I put them in a page oh, so yeah. I know where to go. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah, Thank you. Bye.